Today's panel discussion is going to be a great uh, discussion on copyright, estate planning, and Uncle Sam. The things that you need to know as an artist and creating your own business and uh, avoiding the pitfalls that happens when uh, you're not aware of what you need to do. We have uh, two very distinguished uh, panelists, speakers. One is C. Sean Fox. He's an attorney with Louisville Law Firm of Siler Waterman LLC. He represents individuals, family-owned businesses, assisting them in the areas of state planning and administration, corporate and business law, intellectual property, and intellectual property litigation. Mr. Fox frequently lectures to community and professional groups on estate administration, litigation, guardianship, estate planning, and intellectual property law. He is the former chair of the probate and estate section of the Louisville Bar Association, and is a member of the Kentucky Bar Association and the Estate Planning Council of Metro Louisville. We also have Kyle Ann Citronelle, who is a member of Siler Waterman LLC in Louisville, Kentucky. Ms. Citronelle concentrates her practice in the areas of intellectual property, litigation, and transactions, and commercial and products liability litigation. Ms. Citronelle represents a diverse clientele in the arts, entertainment, media, publishing, and technology industries, and manufacturers of products ranging from jewelry, gifts, tabletop, seasonal, to nutritional and dietary supplements, security, office and store fixtures and furnishings. So once again, I would like to introduce to you Kyle Lance Citronelle and C. Sean Fox. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Citronelle and this is my partner, Sean. Um, we have been asked to give you um, a quick introduction to, uh, to how to plan your businesses so that you maximize uh, your ownership of the rights that your artistic endeavors create, and also so that you minimize the risks relating to liability for infringement and the risks related to operating your business in ways that may or may not protect you from liability or which create issues way down the road in terms of succession planning and uh, testamentary issues and uh, probate. So um, this is kind of a new thing. I've come and lectured to you guys in the past um, about copyright, and we've spent an hour and a half really just touching the surface of the copyright uh, issues themselves, because all of these topics are pretty deep dives when you take them um, individually. And even when you get into issues like copyright or estate planning, there are issues in those topics that could all by themselves have a program. So uh, we'll, what we decided to do today was to look at the life cycle of a creative enterprise. And that is from the time that there's an idea to the end of the life cycle of the business, which is when succession planning and probate issues arise. Um, and Sean and I are going to take it in bites back and forth. The other thing that we really wanted to do was we wanted to look at the, the arts entrepreneur both as a maker of intellectual property and as a buyer and consumer of intellectual property. Because in truth, um, at this time in history, every single one of us either makes intellectual property or uses it. And that is even more true in the arts focused business. Um, a little background about us in addition to what uh, you've already heard. Sean and I have practiced together for over 20 years. We've litigated 
over 60 copyright infringement cases together. Um, and uh, we have guided arts, entertainment, publishing media, and tech clients through business transactions, succession planning, and intellectual property asset probate issues. And the one thing that I know uh, that we agree uh, wholeheartedly is that um, in order to do this in a wise way, you have to understand what you have and you have to plan for its protection at all points in the life cycle. And it is something that you need to be doing with your lawyer before you have a problem. So um, to get into it, I, I, I'm gonna just sort of start because the first thing, I think, well, I think we're going to talk about the life cycle of, of one of these uh, creative enterprises. And so the first thing that we would talk to clients about is to try to determine um, what you have um, and what you're trying to, to sell, perhaps. So I think, you know, Kyle, if you can help these guys understand, you know, what you would tell to a client when they first come in okay. um, to your office. Great. The first thing I would want to do with a client is work with them to identify and inventory the intellectual property assets that they have. Into, there are lots of different kinds of intellectual property. Each one of them has its own regimen for protection and, uh, and idiosyncrasies in terms of duration. Um, so just to go in the old days when there were libraries and you had spines on books, if you had gone to the intellectual property section, there would have been a book called Copyright. And we will eventually focus on that today because in the arts business, copyright is uh, the quintessential right because it protects fixed expression. Um, but there's also trademarks and trade dress, which are names and short phrases, colors, um, anything that is a source identifier for a business um, and its products and services. There are also trade secrets. Trade secrets are any kind of information that gives your business an advantage as long as it is reasonably protected and not generally known or knowable. So in your context, that could be formulas for a patina. It could be information about works in progress, products in development. It could be um, a list of, of potential of your galleries um, and how you and connections with them. Um, vendors up level and down levels, how you, where you source your materials. As long as these are business advantages and you take steps to protect them, we'll talk a little bit about them, you have the ability to protect those as trade secrets. And then um, there's the other, uh, there's also patents, which can cover inventions like utility inventions, so non-obvious advances. Um, that could be um, mechanisms that you use to create your works, um, those sorts of things. Patents can also apply to designs and design patents can protect the decorative aspects of utilitarian objects, which can be very important. Um, and lastly, there's the rights of publicity, which can protect you as um, up and coming celebrities in your field but also be, need to be recognized because if you are working using uh, celebrity images or likenesses in your creations, um, that can create liability issues. So um, we work with our art, with our clients to make sure that they have an uh, that they identify those aspects of their business and that they know who owns it and how long they last, which we will touch on as well. Um, it, if we, what's very, very important in every business is that you start thinking about intellectual property from the very beginning. 
we like to tell our clients that you need to design what you create to protect it. So you need to know what you are using and buying and what you are creating and then buy or consume other people's intellectual property in a way that limits your risk. With copyright, and like I said, we're just going to skirt over this as quickly as we can. Copyright protects tangible expression. Um, and in your business, that would be sculptures, but all uh, art most artistic expression is protected by copyright. Tangible works are those which are fixed in a, yeah, we can do that. There we go. Uh, which are fixed in a way that makes them uh, reproducible over and over and over again. So an example of unfixed is a wildflower garden, however beautiful, it does not come back the same every year and therefore is not protectable by copyright. Let's talk about what copyright is for a minute because um, many of you have heard this, but I want you to have it burned into your mind. Copyright is an intangible right. You cannot touch it. It lives separately from the expression uh, that it embodies, that embodies it. it. If you could touch it, it would appear like a broom, which is created of separate little straws, all of which can be broken out into indivisible pieces and manipulated in commercial transactions. So imagine the right to reproduce, the right to prepare derivative works, which is the right to go from two dimensions to three dimensions, or to go from a novel to a movie, to go from English to Spanish. Those are all in, uh, derivative works. To go from two dimensions to a, you know, from a, a cartoon to a stuffed animal, um, that's a derivative work. The right to distribute is exclusively owned by the author. The right to perform publicly or to state, display publicly and the, the electronic right, which is the right to transmit. The author of a work owns the work. And um, that is a very important aspect in planning your business, because if you engage independent contractors to work with you, or you have collaborators in the process of creation, you are inviting co-owners. And the only way to deal with that is to deal with it upfront, in writing, and, the, and it works like this. If you have an employee who is creating work in the course of their business, meaning that is their job, then the, what the employee creates belongs to you as the employer. If you are working with an independent contractor, then the work belongs to the independent contractor unless there is a work for hire agreement and the work for hire agreement covers one of the categories that can be work for hire and there are not many sculpture is not one of them works uh, so you have spent uh, you it could be a contribution to a collective work it could be a motion picture or an audio visual work a translation a supplementary work which is an illustration an instructional text, a test, answer material for tests, an atlas, all of those things can be work for hire. If it's not one of those things, it cannot be, and you need a written agreement which assigns the rights to you so that you own the contribution of your collaborator. Um, that, so we've got that. In, a, in the process of understanding what is protectable, um, it is important to understand that it needs to be original, but originality is a very low threshold. For example, 
that is original enough to have been infringed. Um, if there is authorship which owes it is authorship which owes its origin to the creator, that is originality for copyright purposes. For patents, for example, there is a novelty standard, but in copyright there is not. And in fact, independent creators can create similar works as long as they do not copy each other. Um, when you design to make it as protectable as possible, uh, that is what you need to know. Ideas are as free as the air. If you have a good idea, the only way to protect it is by using a confidentiality agreement until such time as the idea becomes fixed and can be protected by copyright. Procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, principles of discovery, these things are not protectable by copyright. If you are going to protect them, they have to be done contractually. Public domain works are not protectable. You can use them. Those are published works that predate 1926. Copyright does not protect titles or short phrases. It does not protect sans affair. I need to find shoes sticking out from under the toilet. Where is it? Dang. All right. Well, sans affair. Uh, actually, that's also sans affair. Sans affair are objects and images that are um, common to certain themes. In novels, it's frequently girl meets boy. They're from the wrong side of the track. Um, their parents don't get along. Tragedy ensues. Um, in the visual realm, this is an example of Sansa Fair. Diodato took a photograph, Kate Spade had a similar photograph. Um, there, there was a question about whether there was access, but regardless, the issue here that I wanna point out is there are certain setups that are just so common that they are not protectable. Also not protectable are works of utility. So in certain, and this is, uh, so in certain arenas, there are objects which incorporate utilitarian aspects. Um, work, works of utility are not protectable. If you cannot separate the function from the design elements. Recently, the Supreme Court ruled that cheerleader uniforms could be protectable. I know we have the cheerleader uniforms here, but we won't worry about it. Because you could set, pull apart the, de, the design elements and they could stand separately and be protected. So works of utility is a thing to be aware of. Obviously, every single one of these topics is so broad that we could spend an hour and a half talking about them. They are covered in the handouts that are being distributed. And the point for you to have in your head is when you encounter them, you need to be aware of them and reach out for an answer if you have a question. So um, that's the sort of the entree to the copyright sphere. Let's get into the next part of what you do when you're setting up a business. And this is where Sean comes in. Somebody comes in and they want an entity. They want to do the other piece, protect the, not the asset, protect the person. Sure. So at this point, you know, um, every business is unique and you really have to dig into the specific aspects of any particular business to determine what form of an entity might be best suited for that particular individual. So first type of entity that you can have is just as an individual. 
something called a sole proprietorship, which just means you're operating your business in your own name. There's no real separation from you, the individual, and your business. All of the, uh, you have all of the responsibility, all of the liability, and you enjoy all of the profits from that business. Uh, everything in there is reported through your own social security number on your tax returns. So there's no real distinction between the business and you. The next form of uh, business entity that you can have is a partnership or a joint venture. So a partnership is going to be a group of people who are getting together to operate a business. If it's just you, then we're obviously not going to be talking about partnerships. But if there are multiple people that are together uh, that are going to operate the business and share responsibilities, you can have a partnership. Uh, a partnership needs to be documented with a partnership agreement because that partnership agreement is going to delineate who has what responsibilities and who receives what shares of profits, et cetera. So you need to set all of those things out uh, in this partnership agreement. And you know, as Kyle and I often talk to our clients about, it's much better to be having these, uh, facing these issues when it's a conversation between you and the partner uh, at the early stages when you're just getting started than it is to start facing these issues at the tail end when it's already a fight. Um, when there's already a brawl going on, it's really hard to get everybody to sit down and talk about these issues. But at the outset, it's much easier to do so. And that's the best time for you to have some of these conversations about who's going to do what, potential exit strategies if something goes wrong, et cetera. Now, some of the aspects that you want to think about as a partnership is that partnership agreement is going to say how the profits are split. So uh, you're going to split the profits in those percentages. <clears throat> if there's not uh, you know, some kind of delineation of the percentages, then everything is equal. Uh, you can have different types of partnerships. So if you just have a general partnership, which is a group of people getting together to operate a business, then every one of those partners is financially responsible for the business and each one of those partners can bind the business. Uh, if you wanna have a situation where not all of the partners have full liability, then you can have something called a limited liability partnership and that is very similar to a partnership, um, but you do have to register that with Secretary of State and set up that business. Uh, and in that case, there has to be a general partner who's responsible for all the liability and who is the decision maker that can bind the business. But the limited partners are not liable for the obligations of the business. Uh, other than partnerships, you can have uh, something called a C corporation. Generally think of that as just a, a corporation. Anything with the, the letters Inc behind it is a corporation. And in a corporation, that's a formal business structure. You have to set that up with the Secretary of State, filing certain documents. I'm not gonna get into the weeds of exactly what has to be done to start a corporation. One of the downsides to a corporation is there's something we call double taxation. So in a corporation, you have the structure of there's a president vice president, et cetera. Uh, and there are defined roles in that corporation and there are shareholders who receive the profits. But uh, in that corporation, the corporation when it earns money has to pay tax on its earnings. And then when the corporation distributes the funds out to its shareholders, each of the shareholders pays tax on the distribution that they received. So in that way, there's kind of double taxation on the earnings of the business. Uh, even in a corporation, you need to document everything and have the appropriate documents setting forth what everyone's responsibilities are so that if there's ever an issue, um, all of that is clear. Kind of a, a very similar spin on the corporation is an S corporation. And an S corporation has a similar structure to a, corp a C corporation, but it does allow you to do um, pass through taxation or taxation just like a partnership to where each of the partners shares in the profits and losses of the company. I'm not gonna get into the weeds of when it's better to have an S corporation versus a C corporation, um, but there are instances where one is better than the other. Um, as an alternative to corporations, you can have something called a limited liability company. This is again going to have limited liability for its owners, 
just like corporations where the owners are not liable for the expenses of the business. In a limited liability company, the owners are not responsible for the liabilities of the business itself. And limited liability company allows you to have kind of a hybrid structure where you can have a structure similar to a corporation or you could have a structure more similar to a partnership. There's a lot of flexibility with how you build uh, a limited liability company. Again, you want to have all of those things set forth um, on how that business is going to operate in the initial documents called uh, an operating agreement. And then uh, there are some other entities you could look at uh, you know, operating through a trust or through a nonprofit organization. Um, obviously, those have their own requirements. Uh, if you have a nonprofit organization that you're going to run your business through, then um, you can't share in the profits to stay within the company. Uh, there is also a, a new form of business that is becoming more and more popular. It's called a B corporation or a benefits corporation. There are some distinctions here, but the main thing that you need to know about a benefits corporation is it's distinguished uh, in this way. A corporation, uh, all the responsibilities of the officers of that company are to the shareholders, driven by trying to profit so that the shareholders benefit. In a benefit corporation, the company can actually have other goals. So they can have um, societal type goals, uh, whether it's benefiting the environment or things of that nature that it allows the share of the officers to actually take into consideration those charitable type goals um, that to benefit society or the environment, et cetera, in order to have that as a, uh, one of the key principles of the business. You have to set those goals out in you know, the initial documents, but you can do uh, have that flexibility in a benefits corporation. Benefits corporations are not recognized by every state. So you have to really look at your specific state law to determine whether you can have a benefit corporation or in what form you can have a benefit corporation. And then there is a distinction between a benefit corporation, which is usually the, the type of corporation that a state allows and something called a B Corp. A B Corp is a specific certification that a business can receive. So you can be both a benefit corporation under state law and a B Corp if you receive this specific certification. And there are certain requirements that have to be met, um, some fairly stringent requirements in order to be certified as a B Corp. Uh, but if any company is interested in that, we can certainly put you on the right path uh, to knowing what needs to be done to be qualified as such. Now that we've kind of talked about, you know, all of the entities that are there for you to have as options in order to protect yourself. And again, key is, talking to a lawyer or someone that, that can guide you through this process, your accountant is also very helpful in determining which entity choice would be best. Now that you know those choices, uh, the next step is to really talk about how to protect uh, your business and what the actual operations of your business. So Kyle, if you want to tell these guys how we would help someone kind of protect the actual operations of their business. Yeah. So, um, we're assuming your business is IP driven. That means that you are making an intellectual property asset um, and that you are getting ready to protect it in the course of operating your business. Um, Sean mentioned documentation and I, I wanna lean into that uh, a lot because the there are places particularly in the intellectual property arena where you must have written agreements uh, and uh, and we're going to we're going to talk about that the the time and Sean said this too the time to get a written agreement is when everybody is still friends if you are trying, if it is the time when you are fighting about what your agreement was, it is too late. And it is if you are being infringed or if you are being sued for infringement, looking for documents at that moment 
can be, or trying to create them can be too late. So, the, so in order to protect your assets, it's, we want you to be aware of what you need to do. Let's start with, with copyright, you must register the copyright with the copyright office. You have copyright at the moment of creation of your work. And in the law, we say it springs into existence at the moment of creation, like from the head of Zeus. But, and you have that. Remember the broom I showed you with the little indivisible rights? The minute you create something, that broom and those rights are yours. However, if you are infringed, you must have a registered copyright to go to court and sue for infringement. You must have a registered copyright to go to court and stop the infringement. And it is paramount that you do that. We don't often talk about war stories. In fact, I almost never talk about war stories, but the one war story that I might, because I don't really like to talk about my clients, it's their business to talk about me. But I have one client that lets me talk about him and I wanna talk about him right here, right now, because he's the perfect example of what we're trying to communicate. There is a company in, in Louisville called Bandana they make fanciful animal sculptures called Yardbirds. Between 2002 and 2015, they had over 40 lawsuits against every retailer in America for carrying imported knockoffs of their sculptures. One Sunday morning, the owner of that company woke up and found an insert in the New York Times, the Sunday New York Times, distributed to 2 million plus households. And that insert on the very cover of the Linens and Things distribution were photographs of identical knockoffs of his work using his trademarks to describe them. And his, his galleries started calling saying, why are you licensing Linen and Things to sell copies of your works for 10% what we sell them for in our galleries? You can imagine what a nightmare that was because we had been working with him in advance. We had his copyright registrations done. We had his work for hire agreements in place. We were able to go to court within a week of discovering the infringement, get a preliminary injunction and get every infringing item off the shelves of those stores until the case was resolved. If you do not have the documentation upfront and personal, Moving with that speed is almost impossible. And courts will hold it against you if you cannot move fast because they will only grant injunctions to people who demonstrate that it's an emergency. And if they think you've been sitting on it too long, they don't think it's an emergency because you didn't think it was an emergency. And that can be very perilous in a scenario like that. So. Documents that you need to have on hand to protect your works. You need to have copyright registrations. They are not a particularly expensive thing to do. Go, you can go to the Library of Congress website, pull up a, a, a form VA and register your works. It can be a little complicated if it's a work for hire. It can be a little complicated if you're trying to register groups of related work. And I want you to be aware that it used to be the copyright process was sort of forgiving. It looks like the Supreme Court is gonna take away that forgiveness this summer. So why, if, you, if you are doing anything where you have questions about the application, 
ask a lawyer. Don't just fill out the form and hit submit. It's better than a blank, but it's not it you want to you want your documentation to be perfect. The other stuff that you need to have on hand is chain of title documentation. And by that I mean if you are working with a collaborator, you want to either have the assignment of the rights or if you have or you want to have the agreement where you have an understanding about the division of the ownership of those rights. The copyright law assumes that co-creators are 50-50 owners, no matter their contribution. So, um, well, so for example, where you had, there was a beautiful sculpture and a base, not to take away from the base, but the base had very little but some artistic contribution in a copyright fight that ensued over the ownership of that work. It was determined that they were 50 50 owners because the sculpture and the base were meant to go together and the determination of the court was that they were co authors as a result. This is one of those scenarios where you need the document up front instead of later so that you're not fighting about that. Other documents that you need to have in writing, you need to have any assignments of rights. So if somebody is transferring ownership to you or vice versa, that must be in writing. Uh, licenses, let's go back to the broom. Imagine the broom and we're taking out the one, the, the, the piece of the broom that was the right to reproduce. A license can be the right to reproduce in Italy. A license can be the right or the right to reproduce, but only um, in the English language. Uh, look at the derivative work right. It can be only the right to create stuffed animals from your two-dimensional work, but it could be the right to create any two and distribute those through certain kinds of tiers in the commercial market. My point, you have the ability to manipulate that broom through licensing where you authorize others to exercise your rights. Licenses can be verbal. I recommend they be in writing so you're not fighting about them after the fact. If, however, you are granting or receiving an exclusive license, it must be in writing. Additionally, confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements. Remember how you protect an idea before you have the expression? or you protect any kind of trade secrecy or confidential information, you need those confidentiality agreements in writing. Last but not least, you guys are in the visual artists realm and the Visual Artists Rights Act protects you in a very different way. It grants to you two other rights when you're protecting visual arts. Visual arts are paintings, drawings, sculptures, or photographs in limited editions of 200 or less, which are signed and numbered. Um, the Visual Artists' Right Act does not apply to commercial art. It does not apply to work made for hire. Even if you have transferred your copyright to somebody else, even if you had sold the actual tangible work to somebody else, the Visual Artist Rights Act accords to you these two rights. The right of integrity, which is to protect the work from mutilation, and the right uh, of paternity, which is the right to either have your name recognized as the author or not if you do not want it there. I do want to show you two quick pictures. The Visual Artists Rights Act has a bunch of teeth and it commands quite compelling uh, damages. Oopsie daisy, there we go. Uh, Kent Twitchell 
recovered over a million dollars for the destruction of his Ed Riska mural. The 21 artists who brought the five points case against the real estate developer that whitewashed the Mecca of graffiti art, those guys split $6.75 million. You can go back now. The Visual Artists Rights Act, your rights can only be waived by you and they can only be waived in writing. Murals are very popular right now. And um, be aware if you are signing a VERA waiver when you accept a mural commission or any other commission for that matter, uh, because that waiver could cost you the ability to enforce your integrity and paternity rights. There are a couple other things that relate to other rights that I do want to touch on, um, and that is this. You want to use intellectual property notices on your work. That's part of the protection. Uh, in copyright, it's not required. It is good intellectual property hygiene. Um, if you are protecting trade secrets, you want to do it with consistency and you wanna know what those trade secrets are and put your employees or whomever you're sharing the secret with on notice that it's a secret and get their awareness that it is not to be shared. Ben Franklin said a secret between three people is only safe if two of them are dead. And that is true. And so, uh, the, so the deal on that one is this. If you have a secret and you want to protect it, and remember what I said, that's any advantageous business information that you just don't want your competitor or somebody leaving your employee to march down the street with and do their own thing with, then you need to be thinking about protecting that through confidentiality agreements or employment agreements which contain confidentiality and potentially non-competition language. And those kinds of things must be in writing. The other thing that you need to do is, yes, agreements change. You can't, you know, there are reasons that they change over time. You have to document those changes and keep those in writing too. Um, in terms, so that's how your the 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 documentation piece that you want to protect. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about limited liability. Um, before we jump into the operating piece, because limited liability is an interesting concept, but in copyright, it's very elusive. Um, limited liability means that you're using these business structures to prevent, say, your house from being answerable for your business's liability. For example, you have an employee who's running uh, deliveries and runs over, God forbid, a child um, while doing work that could create liability for you. Insurance is a great thing to have. It's one of the four financial officers you should always have if you're in business. There's a lawyer, an accountant, an insurance agent, and a banker. You want all four of them on speed dial. You want all four of them to know your first name. You want all four of them to pick up your phone calls when you ring. The insurance agent can help you with that piece. My point in the intellectual property arena and particularly in copyright is if you are the managing agent of your business and you have a financial stake in the business, you can still be answerable for liability for copyright infringement. Copyright infringement is strict liability. And by that, we mean this. It doesn't matter if you meant to infringe or not. If you have infringed, you are liable for the damages. The copyright registration piece is an important part of how you know what damages you are answerable for. If you register um, before the infringement, then you, have, you can elect damage remedies. Uh, there's a statutory damages remedy, and you can uh, cover attorney fees. 
If you do not register until after infringement, it is okay. You can still register, but you cannot recover attorney fees and you cannot elect statutory damages. You are limited to recovering actual damages only. And that is your losses or the bad guy's profits. So, uh, and as I said, you individually can be answerable for those damages in a copyright context because as a managing agent under the Copyright Act, you are also jointly liable for those damages. Um, so that's, that's a, the piece, the part about protecting, uh, getting teed up to protect. You want to create the registration schemes that allow you to enforce your rights through registration of copyright or registration of trademark or registration of your patent rights. The, and you need to document chain of title and contracts that relate to the ownership of those rights and contracts that relate to how the revenues of those transactions are going to be distributed. There are also um, operating issues that have to do with the business. Um, and uh, that's the next piece that Sean's gonna take on. And before we jump there, I do wanna take just one second to point out one quick thing is, you know, Kyle talked about documenting assignments. And one of the things that you, you need to make sure that you document is if you start an entity and that entity is going to be the one doing the business, Good point. you need to make sure that you are documenting the assignment from you, the individual who may have done the original artistic work and had that, uh, you're documenting that assignment from you to the business, but it could create a problem down the road if you have to protect that right and you did not assign that to the business or there wasn't a written assignment to the business it could pose problems and then we recently had a case where the business changed names a couple of times went bankrupt transferred assets the good news was that their attorney uh, was aware of these issues and created documents that made sure that that ball kept bouncing but i will tell you that the defendant in that case dug into every ownership document like uh like it was a colonoscopy and uh -huh. um and and had those documents not been there it would have been a very unfortunate turn in that litigation because what we are seeing is the most recent trend in copyright litigation is for the infringer to attack the copyright registration itself yeah. um, and so in that regard uh, you can do the registration yourself, um, but I would recommend that you at least talk to an attorney to do maybe the first couple and, and to kind of explain to you what's going in what place on the application form uh, until you understand it well enough to do it yourself, because um, today they are really attacking those documents. And if you put the wrong thing in the wrong place or say it the wrong way, it can be a problem in the end. Um, and then I did notice that we had a question in the chat about whether or not you can have a blanket registration. Um, there are circumstances in which you can have, you can register a collection of works, but you have to fall under certain criteria. So not every collection can be registered together. Otherwise, you have to register each individual work. The Copyright Office has circulars, which explain, uh, are actually brilliant and easy to understand documents. And they answer questions about related work registrations. Um, one of the sort of as a guidepost, there are blanks in copyright in copyright applications. Two of those blanks are year of creation and date of first publication. As sort of a threshold, you can't, you every work that you register use trying to use one application has to share those dates in common. Similarly, they if you're going to do uh, groups of unpublished works, they all have to be unpublished works. 
So this is what Sean is talking about there that when you're doing that first application or those first couple of applications, it doesn't hurt to work with a lawyer on them. Then you'll know what to do. The forms are very easy to fill out once you're comfortable that you're putting the right information in the blanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the other operating formalities don't relate so much to registration mm -hmm. though. What are so, those? So in order for you to keep the limited liability that a business, uh, you know, a corporation, an S corporation, um, a limited liability company, the protection that those provide, you have to continue to follow business formalities. So you have to have articles of organization or articles of incorporation for the business. You need to have annual minutes. So even if it is, you know, me, myself and I sitting down for a minute and saying, here's my goals for the year. Oh, I had a meeting and here's what I want to do going forward and then document that meeting. Now, do you, you know, do you really have that meeting uh, kind of happen in your head if it's just you, but you still need to document that there, those annual meetings are taking place. You need to have a business account. So the business needs to have its own separate uh, bank accounts. And you need to run all of the revenues and expenses of the business through that business account. You cannot use your account as the business's account and you cannot use the business's account as your account. If you start commingling those types of things, then it can break down those protections. And you know somebody in a lawsuit could potentially do what they call piercing the corporate veil, which is ignore the company and come after you uh, and destroy those, uh, those liability protections that were there and come after your own assets. So you wanna make sure you are following all those kinds of formalities of the business to make sure that uh, you keep those protections. Again, some of the other things that you want to document in there is you need to really document work for hire. Um, you need to document any kind of licensing that's going on, whether you're licensing some your works for someone else to use, uh, or whether you're licensing someone else's work um, to use in, in your art. So if you are uh, trying to make something that looks similar to another work, uh, whether it's just a piece or in, in large part, you need to get a license from the original author that says that you have the right to do that. If you don't, you could end up facing copyright infringement of your own. So you want to make sure those things are all documented. Uh, some of the other things that you want to consider in kind of operating your business uh, is what you're selling. Um, if you're doing sculpture or other artistic pieces, um, what you're selling is the actual object or piece of art itself. You are not selling the copyright rights. That, that broom. broom. That bundle of <laughs> rights. You are not selling the whole broom. You are only selling that piece. And so you still retain those other rights, whether it's to reproduce, uh, et cetera. So you want to make sure that, that you understand you're not selling those rights. And you can actually sell those separately. Um, and so keep those kinds of things in mind. Uh, now, once you sell the physical piece, then that belongs to the buyer and the buyer can subsequently sell that piece as they wish. Um, and you don't have any control over that. But if you are selling just a copyright, one of those rights um, to maybe reproduce your right, then you can place limitations on how and when they could uh, you know, sell or transfer your image or your work. Now, one of the other big things to contemplate in running any business, and I know nobody likes to talk about this topic, but you have to think about taxes. And there are several types of taxes that you must consider. Um, and I've given you a list in that handout that we provided. Um, not every tax is applicable to every business or in every state, but you do want um, to keep in mind you know, what those taxes are and you wanna talk to your accountant and make sure you are paying those taxes. So you're going to have income tax. You may have to deal with sales and use tax, um, property taxes. Uh, some states have entity taxes, uh, gross receipts taxes, occupational license taxes, self-employment taxes. Sometimes there are state and local taxes. 
um, you really need to, to talk to your accountant before you get started and make sure you are uh, dotting all of your I's and crossing all of your T's when it comes to those taxes. And like I said, not all of those apply, depending upon the type of business structure you have. Uh, for instance, you may or may not have uh, self-employment tax to be paid. <clears throat> if you are operating as a sole proprietorship, then you will have self-employment tax to deal with. Uh, when it comes to what do I count as income? So what do I have to, uh, there is a downloadable PDF of the handout, I believe. Um, and I think they're gonna tell you more about that uh, as we kind of wrap up. Um, but do we, those materials are available to you. So if you guys wanna download those, you should have uh, a lot of helpful materials. But when it comes to income, uh, best thing to, to think about is the IRS considers pretty much every penny that's coming in uh, as income to you. So you might as well go ahead and plan to count that as income and report it uh, to the IRS on your tax returns. There are obviously some exceptions, but in most cases, uh, whether it's money coming in or whether you're trading, bartering, whatever it may be, if you're getting value of some sort, the IRS is probably gonna count that as income. Uh, so without getting too deep into that, I would just consider everything you receive as income and plan to report that. Uh, your deductions uh, for tax purposes are a little bit different. So two types of deductions that I really wanna talk uh, about with you today are uh, the charitable deduction. So if you are giving your works away to charity and you wanna take a deduction on your income taxes um, for giving that away to charity. For most people uh, who own art and are giving it away to charity, they are entitled to take the value of that art as the value of their deduction. For most of you, as the artist who created the work, that's not the same rule for you. Unfortunately, for artists, to give, when they give away their own work, that charitable deduction is limited to the cost of the supplies to create that work. So even if you create a brilliant masterpiece um, and you give that away to charity um, and you wanna take a million dollar deduction because you gave away this very valuable piece of art, you can't. You have to step back and the only thing you can deduct are the cost of the supplies. So sculpture, you know, uh, whether it's clay or, or whatever mm -hmm. medium you're using, um, and other supplies that you would have. Um, for painters, you know, it's the cost of the paint, the paint brushes, the canvas. Those are the only things that you can deduct. So that is very limited, and you want to be very careful about that um, on your tax returns. Is there any way to get the to to put the P under the basket? <laughs> I, you you, know. you could try to be creative, um, but you just have to be careful in that creativity. Um, so things to watch or um, some people would think, hey, if I give my art away to somebody else and then they give it to charity, then they can take a deduction for the value. Well, that's not true either because it's a gift. And when you gift something to someone, you give them your cost basis in that piece. And so your limitation to the cost of supplies flows through to that person to whom you gave the art piece. So they would be limited as well. Could you sell that piece to someone else and then that person uh, give it to charity? And could that person to whom you sold it, could they get a deduction uh, for the value? Yes, that's possible. Now there are some limitations to that as well. Um, in order to take a deduction for uh, art, you have to have held the art, the piece of art for a year uh, or more. So there's gonna there's got to be some space in there because um, I think in any situation if you if you sold a piece to somebody for a dollar and then they tried to take a, you know a ten thousand dollar deduction two days later the IRS is going to look at that and they're going to consider it exactly what it was uh, with kind of what we call a sham transaction um, and they're not going to let that work uh, but if it is planned appropriately and there's sufficient space and sufficient planning then I think you might be able to put the P under the rug just a little bit, but I would do some very careful planning and we would obviously involve your accountant in that as well, uh, because as much uh, as I may advise you, 
I am not the person who's signing your income tax return. So we want the person who's signing your income tax return uh, to be on board and make sure they're comfortable with whatever plan it may be. Uh, one other kind of expense limitation that I want to talk to you about is something we call the hobby loss rules. So each of you as an artist is engaged in a business. Um, the IRS questions whether that is whether what you're doing is actually being run as a business or whether you're engaging in art as a hobby. And so the IRS wants to say that you're just doing this as a hobby uh, because many artists have other jobs, um, you know, and uh, and so it's an easy argument for the IRS to make. The distinction there is this, if you are doing art as a hobby, then you are limited to deducting only those expenses uh, up to the extent that you have revenue or income from those activities. So if you're operating at a loss, which uh, you know can happen uh, in artistic endeavors, then you may be limited to the expenses that you can claim up to whatever you know um, sales income that you may have uh, or other income so that can be very limiting uh, if it is considered a hobby if you are operating this artistic business as a business enterprise then the you have you can deduct any of your expenses related to uh, to that endeavor and you can even do that in excess of the income that you have. So you can have a loss if you're operating as a business. You cannot have a loss if you are doing this as a hobby. And when it comes to knowing whether or not you're doing this as a business or a hobby, there's a complicated set of factors that the IRS looks at. Um, and I've kind of set forth those factors in those materials. We won't dive too deeply into those factors, but just know this, um, you really have to look like you're operating a business for the IRS to consider it as a business. Um, been many, uh, there's not many cases about this, but most of them, they, the courts find that this was done as a hobby. Um, one particular case, there was an artist uh, who was found to be doing this as a business. In that case, some of the things that the court really picked up on um, and seemed to convince them that this was a business is this person documented so much about their business. They documented all of the research that they were doing to create their various pieces. Um, they documented all the time they spent on other activities. One of the things the court noted was also that when you're doing something as a hobby, you usually don't engage in the unpleasant activities related to that because it's a hobby, you wanna do this for fun. And in that case, this person was able to document the unpleasant administrative tasks that they were conducting, such as uh, you know their marketing types of things, sending out mailings to, to potential uh, art collectors, et cetera. Uh, and the other unpleasant things of dealing with the business, the operating types of things, they documented that very well. And that seems to really convince uh, the IRS or the tax court at that point that this was a business. Uh, in that case, this person did actually show a profit twice in about a 20 year span. Um, and that the IRS looked at, and because it was so few times, it wasn't very compelling. But obviously, if, uh, if you do uh, you know, show a profit, then that is helpful. Um, in that case, they looked at other things that were done as well. In that case, um, the artist actually changed uh, galleries in an effort to increase the value of their work and to sell more work to get to the types of uh, you know, collectors that they were looking for that would be more likely to value their works. Those types of things, the, the tax court looked at and said, that sounds more like something a business person would do as opposed to someone who's doing this as a hobby. So again, if you, if you are operating that business, you wanna make sure you're documenting all of those things that make it clear that you're operating this as a business so that you can take advantage of all of those losses if you have them. All right. Uh, now, beyond all of the 
operating types of things that you have to do. Um, occasionally, you actually have to enforce and protect those rights that you have accumulated uh, in order to protect the value that is there. And so now I'm going to let Kyle talk to you about some of the things you must do if that unfortunate situation comes up and you actually have to enforce those rights. Yeah. So we're the the there are the sort of the formula here that we're trying to to get across is the idea that you need to know what you have you need to address how to protect what you have through registrations and appropriate documentation and unfortunately the word documentation probably uh is starting to feel like a sledgehammer to you but it is um a truth that when we get to this next piece of the puzzle, which is the police and enforce piece, uh, documents are your next best friend. So, um, you know, when you get about the process of policing and enforcing, we talked about copy, we really just kind of hit the surface of what copyright is. We, uh, and what's protectable and what kinds of things aren't protectable. Um, there, uh, we do also have these other rights, which are equally important in the police and enforce context, for example, trademarks or trade secrets and patents. So we'll just, I wanna touch briefly on each of them so that you know what triggers inf infringement because it can go in both directions. I mean, you can get accused of infringement as well as want to enforce your rights against an infringer. Um, but let's start. So intellectual property rights must be policed and protected. Um, and the process of policing differs based on the work. A lot of people ask, um, you know, how do you police? Well, if you're a giant mega corporation, you have um, a whole slew of private investigators who travel the world looking for infringements. But if you're just a, your average artist, you will be amazed at how your fan base and those who are aware of the work you create become your enforcement arm. People that collect your work or who have worked with you in the past, people have seen your work in galleries or recognize the kinds of works that you do create or license, they become, they have an, they have emotional and financial investments in your work that mean that their antenna are up for you. And you will find that in many infringement scenarios, that is how you find out about it. When you find out about it, it is very important to make the determination whether it is a little old lady in you know, the church basement um, getting ready for a church you know, sale or whether it's a serious infringement. My point to that is almost all infringements merit a cease and desist letter. Not every kind of infringement merits a, 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 an, an infringement litigation. Um, litigation is, uh, is expensive and time consuming no matter who you are or whether you are the plaintiff or the defendant. And if you can get the infringement to stop with a cease and desist letter, um, it's obviously advantageous. Uh, you don't have to spend uh, an, an indefinite amount of time worrying about court procedures and the related expense. So what is copyright infringement? Well, I said earlier, uh, copyright infringement is, is based on strict liability. So there's no intention requirement. It doesn't matter if you thought you could and you couldn't. If you did, you did. Um, there are different ways to measure whether copyright has been infringed. One of them is substantial similarity. Would somebody looking at the infringement uh, recognize your, that your work has been taken? 
substantial similarity. Uh, another one is what's called fragmented literal similarity, which frequently occurs in music. That's the half note in the My Sweet, you know, in the He's So Fine versus My Sweet Lord case. Um, have fragmented literal similarity frequently arises in computer, uh, when you take computer program language, uh, fragmented literal similarity frequently occurs. Um, in, you know, when you're dealing with things like um, collage um, and the borrowing of elements from other works to create work. Um, and that brings up a whole nother field, which is fair use. I'll take questions about fair use at the end. It is fabulous and wonderful. It is, it is a great defense. It's something I'm incredibly interested in because it's incredibly interesting. Um, fair use excuses takings that are for criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, or research. Um, the, but that it, in the same breath, uh, fair use is a case-by-case -case determination, and um, you need a judge who understands the taking and why it fits into one of these things, and it's not always obvious to the court. Um, also, there's what's called total concept and field taking. Uh, that's a little squishy, but it can get used. Um, and, um, and it's been effective in things like uh, a Care Bears litigation and greeting card litigation. Um, copyright infringement has a three-year statute of limitations, but it is a rolling three-year statute of limitation. In most situations, when people think about statute of limitations, we think, oh, that's the cutoff. After that day, I can't sue anymore. But in copyright, that is not the case. What that means is that you are cut off, that the rolling three-year statute of limitations means that you are unable to collect any damages beyond the date of the action that you're taking. So um, there's that. The, um, in trademark, you have infringement based on uh, what's called Fusing similarity based on sound, meaning, or appearance of the trademark. In trademarks, it is quite important to issue cease and desist letters and very important to stop other users because uh, the failure to do so can dilute your mark and the failure to do so can actually end up constituting an abandonment of your mark. So it, it's, a, it's a highly sensitive move in the trademark scenario. In trade secrets, um, your, your action is for misappropriation um, and it, tend, it is a state by state statute of limitation in Kentucky where we work. It's three years from discovery, that will vary. Um, I repeat, you need to put whoever you're sharing the secret on, uh, on notice of the fact that the secret has been shared and embed in their mind and consciousness that they must protect it. With employees, we recommend annual employee um, interviews. You know, when you do your annual reviews, you remind them, we told you secrets, remember to protect them. When they're leaving your employee, we want you to do the exact same thing. Remember those secrets, you were duty bound to protect them. So um, that you're setting yourself up with the ability to protect them. Don't share, don't share passwords with people that don't need them. Don't share confidential information with people that do not have the need to know. Um, there are lots of ways to lose your trade secrets. There are a lot, but reasonable protection measures is the gravamen against which you'll be judged. Confidentiality agreements and these kinds of reinforcing interviews with people who share those secrets are a very important piece of your evidence and documentation that you've done what you need to. With patents, I do wanna say a couple of things about patents. Patents have 
will last approximately 20 years. Um, patents must be applied for within one year of first public disclosure. So the minute you tell somebody about your invention, whether that's a utility invention, like a mechanical invention, or a design invention, a decorative way that you're producing use utilitarian objects. Remember how in copyright, there's sort of that utilitarian object weirdness place where you may not be able to protect it with a copyright. Design patents come to the rescue in that regard. And design patents are not nearly as expensive as utility patents. And they are judged basically on the same standard as copyrights for infringement purposes. So you should keep those in your wheelhouse. That having been said, you can apply for copyright registration anytime, not so with a patent. With a patent, one year from first publication or you lose your patent rights. And you lose, and in many countries, you uh, cannot even apply for a patent if you've already publicly disclosed. How do you prevent public disclosure? By using copy, confidentiality agreements, because when you have a confidentiality agreement, that's not considered a public disclosure. Uh, there's also the right of, of publicity, and a lot of artists like to pull from the celebrity culture. I get it, it's cool, um, and it's popular, but, uh, but public figures have publicity rights and you may be a public figure based on the, your, the aura of your fame um, and you will have the ability to protect those rights as well. Those are similarly a state by state basis. They are something that you need to take into consideration as we go down the next pipeline because uh, the next piece of the life cycle is planning for the end. These rights will, many of them will live longer than you will. Copyright lives the life of the author plus 70 years. Trademarks can last indefinitely. Um, patents, as I said, last 20 years and depending on when you apply for them and receive the patent registration, you, the, the rights may outlive you. And similarly with rights of publicity, depending on the state you're from, they may outlive, those rights may outlive you. So um, the next part is planning for succession, terminating transfers, which is another piece of the copyright puzzle, which Sean will address, and also pr the probate piece, how you set your estate up to handle intellectual property assets. Okay. So when we're talking about succession planning here, so now not necessarily what do you intend to do with your work, but what do you want your heirs to do with your work? The first thing I want to th talk to you about is how those rights are transferred is somewhat dependent upon how they are owned. If you own them as an individual, or if you have an entity and that entity owns those that bundle of copyright rights, or if you have done some planning and have transferred those rights to a trust. Each of those will kind of distinguish exactly how the transfer is going to happen of those rights at your death. And they'll be a little bit different. If it's an entity that owns the rights, the entity survives your death. You're just the owner and that ownership of the entity transfers upon your death the entity continues and the entity continues to retain those rights. Um, obviously, there are the limitations of how long a copyright or a trademark can last. Those are still applicable. Um, but the actual transfer upon your death, um, there's no difference there because the entity already owned it. Uh, as an individual, it's going to go through your probate estate and go through to your heirs. Uh, and then one of the things we're going to want to talk about is, you know, how do your heirs deal with, with those rights? If you've set up a trust, similar to having an entity, that trust is gonna continue after your death and that trust will own those rights subject to all of those limitations on how long it will last. Um, so from a, a planning perspective, you, know, you need to take into consideration some of the tax considerations. And for today's purposes, 
Um, you know, hopefully each of you gets to that point where we are having a conversation about uh, federal estate taxes. Uh, for you to know, today there is a the federal estate tax applies to all assets that you transfer on death over a certain level. And as of today, that level is anything over $11.7 million. So it's a good problem to have, um, but only like 1% of the country has this problem. Now, <clears throat> that is slated to, to decrease in the years to come. Uh, on January 1, 2026, that is supposed to come down to $5 million. Uh, and uh, it's targeted to inflation. So the actual number will probably be more like six, maybe as high as 7 million. It's also possible that that could come down to 5 million beginning January 1 of next year. Um, some proposed legislation uh, that is out there uh, does make that change to bring that kind of set uh, fallback date to January 1 of 2022. So it's possible, although that legislation hasn't passed. So if you do have assets, including artwork that is of substantial value, then you do want to give consideration to tax planning and you should see an attorney uh, in order to have those conversations and plan accordingly, especially want to see um, an estate attorney to do that. Um, there are different types of taxes that are related to that. There's the federal gift tax uh, exemption, which is the same, as well as something called generation skipping taxes. We don't have enough time to get into the details of those, um, but they can certainly be uh, <clears throat> issues. Uh, there are also limitations to what you can give as a gift to people in any one given year. You can give away to one person up to $15,000 worth of assets, uh, entirely gift tax free without any kind of gift tax reporting requirements. But if you do give to any one individual, any asset that is worth more than $15,000 or assets as an aggregate over an entire year in excess of $15,000, then there may be some reporting requirements and you wanna to talk to your accountant or your lawyer um, to deal with those situations, at least get advice as to what needs to be done. You can also assign your rights, um, whether it's to a corporation, an LLC, a family limited partnership, a trust or some other entity as part of planning and through that planning, um, you may be able to reduce your taxes somewhat. Um, whenever estate tax is going to come into play, one of the most important things is valuing your artwork. And in valuing your artwork for estate purposes, uh, you need to make sure that a qualified appraiser is being used. Uh, now, obviously, you may be gone at that point because it's your estate that's actually valuing all of those things. But you want to make sure you put in place those things to make sure that those heirs are are using a qualified appraiser, or if you're doing this for another artist, you wanna make sure that you are using a qualified appraiser uh, to get those valuations done. Um, and those appraisals will need to be provided to the IRS. Um, <clears throat> other planning things to consider are, how is your artistic work going to be manipulated by your heirs? Who's going to be in charge of dealing with those issues. So for writers, who's gonna deal with publicists? Who's gonna deal with publishing companies? Who's gonna make the decisions on, you know, how those works can be reproduced? Who's going to handle any kind of royalty stream that may be coming in as a result of those works? Who's gonna do that management that you probably were doing while you were living? And one of the things you want to consider is when it comes to your assets that are being passed on to your heirs, these intellectual property rights in your art, uh, you may want to assign someone different to handle those issues as who's going to handle the rest of your belongings and actually giving those, you know, who's going to give your house, your car, those kinds of things onto your heirs. Um, that may be a different person than the person who's going to take care of the intellectual property rights that are there. So you may want to do a will that names something called a literary executor, uh, and you name a separate person who's going to be in charge of all of those intellectual property rights. Uh, and in your documents, you can set forth how you want them to use those rights. You can put limitations on how your work may be used. One other thing that's very important is the termination of rights. So after, and I've got these dates in your materials, so uh, you don't 
have to remember exactly what I said, but um, 35 years after creation, um, tr I'm sorry, transfer, then an artist can terminate any transfer of their intellectual property rights. And this can be very helpful um, in you know, manipulating and taking advantage of any kind of royalty stream that may be coming in from works. Um, but that termination does have to be done within a five year period after that 35 years has passed. And you have to give notices and do some specific things. So you wanna make sure that you're doing that right in order to properly terminate those rights. And then you can transfer them to someone else uh, in order to manage those assets. So that can be a very complicated process. Uh, and it may be uh, you know, your heirs or your literary executor who's dealing with those situations. Um, it's another one of those things that comes down to documentation. You wanna keep very good records so that when the time comes, that information as to who owns those rights now to whom they were transferred is readily accessible so that proper notice can be given to that person. Uh, and then last but not least, I want to talk about um, NIL rights, so name, image, and likeness rights. Every state is a little bit different on whether or not those rights survive you. So if you are a celebrity, and many of you as artists will acquire that kind of celebrity that, um, you know, use of your name, your image, or your likeness may be valuable, even to your heirs. And if that happens, you want to pay close attention to those rights. Um, some states have laws that say they do survive you. Some states have laws that say they do not. Um, Marilyn Monroe's heirs spent years arguing over, you know, where she lived so that they could determine whether or not, which state law was going to apply to her publicity rights. And they lost. It's true. They tried to argue that she really lived in another state where they continued. Um, it was ultimately held that uh, she lived in New York where it dies um, and does not survive you. Um, and that didn't necessarily end all the litigation for her heirs. There was still litigation years to come. But um, those are the kinds of situations that can come up. I'll give you one example. You want to look at every state law. But in Kentucky, uh, your right to privacy does not survive you, but your right to publicity does um, in a limited fashion. Um, so the no person can use your name or likeness for commercial exploitation for a period of 50 years beyond your death without permission from your executor. So for a period of 50 years, the, those rights still survive you and they can be exploited by your literary executor or whomever that may be, uh, if you plan appropriately. So I know we're running out of time, so we can't dive too much deeper. And we did want to leave just a few moments to talk about questions. Yeah. Did you have any other comments? I, I do have one other comment on publicity, and that is that Indiana um, is well has probably the broadest publicity protection statute. It protects everything, including signatures. It's one of the reasons why many of these big licensing companies use Indiana as their domicile. Um, the other thing is that we want you to be ready for success. So we want you to know what you have. We want you to design your products for maximum protection, buy and use other IP to minimize risk, keep your product history, keep your chain of title documents, document your deal terms and any changes to those deal terms, be prepared to police and enforce your rights. When it matters, you need to be able to move quickly. And please do not be afraid to contact your attorney. A phone call is cheaper than a lawsuit. A contract is cheaper than a lawsuit. And uh, we are here to help you. It's really been a privilege to talk with you today. Thank you so much.